quorum having been established, I call up Senate Bill 1, sponsored by Senator Laughlin, for the committee's consideration. I will uh, make the motion to consider the bill. Do we have a second? Senator Phillips Hill. Okay. Uh, Senator Laughlin, I think, is present. Do you want to speak on your bill? Uh, sure. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Chairman Dush and members of the State Government Committee for the opportunity to speak today. The right to vote is among our most treasured constitutional rights and founding principles of our nation. A recent Franklin and Marshall College poll found that 74 percent of Pennsylvanians support requiring voters to present identification to vote. A Monmouth University poll found that nearly 80 percent of Americans favor voter ID on a nationwide poll. Advancing voter ID as a constitutional amendment allows this matter to ultimately be decided by the voters themselves through a ballot question. Voters without a valid ID will be provided one free of charge, and I ask that you support this measure to strengthen election and security and ensure those who participate in our voting process are who they say they are. So I thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Senator Laughlin. And, uh I will call up amendment number A00004, sponsored by myself, and make a uh, motion to uh, accept the amendment. Do we have a second? Senator Mastriano. <clears throat> amendment A00004 would exempt the disapproval of a regulation by the General Assembly from the presentment requirement for the governor's approval or disapproval. Are there any questions or discussions regarding the amendment? Senator Moot. Mr. Chairman, since this is your amendment, can you just elaborate on like an example or why you think that this is necessary? This regulatory state has gotten to the point where uh, we have a lot of unaccountable people making regulations that have, they go into government positions and then uh, create programs that they've really got no expertise on. I think anything that has the force of law, uh, the General Assembly should have some direct oversight of it. That's the way this republic was set up, is that anything that has the force of law, it would be the legislature which would present it and uh, make it into law. Uh, the fact that we've delegated so much authority to the executive branch is, uh, why we have an awful lot of the things that our constituents from our schools, the regulators that are coming in our school boards that are affecting our classrooms, uh, coming from the Department of uh, uh, Education and others. There are, perfect, there are tons of examples that everybody in this legislature deals with daily, the, cons the complaints that we get. So I think it's a very important amendment. And it has been considered in the last uh, session and it was passed and I think it's good for a second consideration. And so when you mean the, the regulators, like like IRC and, and others, I'm assuming, are, are under that bucket of, of entities that you're referring to, or no? IRC is not, but the, each of the executive branch uh, agencies are. Okay. When they, when they promulgate regulations, uh, they have the force of law. And we, like I said, I think the legislature has delegated far too much authority in the past and this is a way to rein that in. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have to say that introducing this amendment about a little over an hour before we're supposed to vote on it feels a bit unconscionable to me. Actually, a bit reminiscent of the infamous late night vote last session that aggressively pushed through a host of unpopular policies as constitutional amendments. Part of our job as legislators is to solicit feedback from our constituents and stakeholders and ensure that what we are doing and what we are considering have their support because they are the people who elected us, as you said. It's power is in their hands. We didn't give them an opportunity to speak their voice on this issue. When we introduce amendments an hour before voting, it robs them of the chance to have their voices heard. But ultimately what this is doing is it's an end around the governor's constitutional authority to provide for regulations and to use his veto power for bills and resolutions adopted by the legislature. It undermines the balance of power inherent in the Pennsylvania Constitution providing for three equal branches of state government. But it doesn't come as a surprise considering that the majority party 
has been cavalierly pushing legislation through constitutional amendments to push unpopular policies that couldn't make, the, make it past the governor's desk. We're now attempting to circumvent the most democratically elected position in the state and control that posi his positions and abilities to regulate. Regulations are authorized by statute and can be altered and amended by statute. The legislature, through negotiation and consultation with the governor's office, has ample power to enact laws to affirm, repeal, or amend regulations. It is only the unwillingness of the majority party to negotiate and work in a bipartisan fashion that is undermining the usual path of passing our statutes and regulations. The rationale? For, for doing constitutional amendments like this is that the majority party found it hard to work with Governor Wolf. Well, guess what? Governor Wolf has eight more days in office. And by passing this amendment, we are not giving an opportunity to work with our governor-elect to determine if the relationship may be different. We we're fortunate enough to get some feedback before, within the hour or so that we've had this amendment. We know that the ACLU of Pennsylvania, labor unions, and environmental communities are all staunchly opposed to this amendment because it undercuts the power of the governor, the usual regulatory process, and puts undue influence in the hands of committee chairs in particular, which is of great concern to me and my constituents. I'll be urging a no vote for my colleagues. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any uh, further questions or discussion? Seeing none. And are there any negative votes on the amendment? Okay. Uh, please call the roll. Argo. Aye. Are there any questions or discussions on Senate Bill 1 as an act? Senator Moon. Thank you. I, um, I guess this kind of goes back to regulations and, and the legislature's ability to change and, and um, update laws as needed. And so um, voter ID is being pushed through here today. And I'm just curious as to, I'm sure there was no appetite to put further details into this as it would change the form from the previous session and therefore wouldn't be on the ballot in the May primary. But in terms of, um, as, as Senator Lawson referenced, um, that his his intent is to protect the vote, right, and to have integrity in our elections, as, as he said. And so knowing that we want to encourage democracy and participation in democracy, is there um, an appetite, hopefully, in the near future for this committee to address making sure that every ballot is processed and counted and allowing counties to pre-canvas? Because we're doing this today, um, and whether I agree with it or not, if it's your true intent is to, in some method, whether I align with that of, of trying to protect democracy, then I would hope that the same level of urgency would be taken to ensure that our elections processes and all of our counties have the ability to process ballots um, because obviously vote by mail has allowed more participation um, in, our, in our elections, which is, I would hope, a shared goal of everyone here that we would want people to be able to vote, um, those who are eligible to vote. So I, I hope that um, it would have been a nice add-on to today's committee agenda instead of a last-minute amendment that this committee brings up the pre-canvassing issue um, to put into our election code. Thank you. I neglected to mention that the amendment passed <coughs> 8 to 3. And uh, are there any other questions or discussions on Senator Luana's amendment? Senator, Senator Kevin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. On January 3rd, I voted against the Senate's operating rules because the current operating rules allow senators to make decisions mm -hmm. without transparency and fail to require adequate notice for legislative activity. And today is the exact reason why I voted against these rules. With less than 24 hours notice, which is within the rules, um, a, meeting, a voting meeting was uh, considered, was called to consider a constitutional amendment that creates new barriers to voting in our elections by requiring official government identification. Pennsylvania already requires an individual to show ID at their voting precinct if it's the first time that they're, they're there voting, and thereafter their signature from year to year is compared to ensure that they are who they say they are. The county is then required to reconcile the votes cast in each precinct with the poll book and provisions are provided to challenge those processes. Voter ID laws like this are known tactics that suppress votes and make it harder for people to access the ballot. 
and said we should be using our power as legislators to empower voters to give them better access to voting, not creating barriers that will make it harder for them to participate in our democracy. We could make election day a holiday, widen access to mail-in ballots, which is a safe and secure way to vote, and if we truly wanted to ensure our constituents have their voices heard in the electoral process, those are just a few things. If we truly cared about a representative government, those are just a few things we can and should be doing. Voter ID requirements disproportionately affect low-income individuals, racial and ethnic minorities, the elderly, and people with disabilities. Such voters have more frequently had difficulty obtaining IDs because they cannot afford and cannot obtain the underlying documents that are a prerequisite to obtaining a government-issued photo ID. As an aside, I had a constituent last session reach out regarding the cost of obtaining a government ID from a third-party vendor because pen dot locations are not always very accessible. Uh, they seem to be dwindling in the numbers that we have official vendor uh, official locations. This person is an older citizen with lower income and unable to get themselves to an official pen dot location. The cost difference for someone in their position is astronomical and unfathomable. But still, voters like my constituent deserve the right as an American to participate in our elections. And if constitutional rights like the one to vote are not of any concern to you, then perhaps the cost implications of voter ID laws should be considered. Voter ID laws are a waste of taxpayer dollars. States incur sizable costs when being implemented, including the cost of educating the public, training poll workers, and providing IDs to vote. Texas spent nearly $2 million on voter education and outreach efforts following the passage of its voter ID law. And Indiana spent over $10 million to produce free ID cards between 2007 and 2010. So I urge my colleagues to vote against this constitutional amendment and to work with me to find ways to increase participation at the ballot rather than vote to impose expensive new barriers to voting. Thank you. Thank you. I just also want to echo um, the inability to live stream um, from this room and just want to thank our caucus comms for live streaming the meeting so that the public mm -hmm. can see what's happening here in this off the floor meeting. So thank you for being here. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just on the question of the, uh, the timeliness of this, uh, everybody on this committee has been on this uh, prior session and has been around through the prior session. There have been no changes to either the amendment or the uh, the bill, the underlying bill, uh, the and it is on the second time around. So this is not something that has been uh, not out there in the public, and that is why we felt comfortable with bringing this up because it's been almost a year and a half now since uh, it's been out there for the public to, to be aware of. So. <clears throat> If there's no further discussion, are there any negative votes on the bill? I would right, just add that we'll also, Mr. Chairman, we were made aware of this meeting at 7.45 last night, so if we were, I don't know that the public is fully informed in a timely manner, but I apologize for interrupting you. The clerk will call the roll. Vote being eight to three, the uh, Senate Bill of One is reported out of the Senate Government State Government Committee as amended. I now call up Senate Bill 130, sponsored by Senator Coleman, for the committee's consideration. I will make a motion to consider the bill that we have a second. Senator Roger. Senator Coleman is recognized to speak on the bill. Thank you, Chairman Dush. As you know, this constitutional amendment deals with requiring election audits by the Auditor General after each election. This will be the second time this constitutional amendment was brought in front of the General Assembly as it was passed last session. If passed this session, the question of mandating election audits will go in front of the voters and they will decide how the Commonwealth should proceed on such an important issue. And that's exactly what I think is this issue is important. Time and time again, polling has shown that there is a significant lack of confidence in our election system. And this constitutional amendment 
amongst other issues and legislation, will go a long way toward addressing that lack of trust. There is nothing that I can see in this measure that is controversial. People elect the Auditor General, and a clear and transparent auditing of an election is a common sense approach that would allow our elections to be improved and trusted. I look forward to continuing to work on this issue as it moves through the process. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Palmer. Are there any questions or comments on the bill? Thank you, Senator Dosh. I oppose Senate Bill 130, constitutional amendment that would require additional auditing of our elections. And perhaps many people don't know, but Pennsylvania law already requires two types of audits. The first is in the computation and tabulation of our election results. Counties are required to reconcile votes cast in each and every precinct with the poll books. And then that law provides the provisions to challenge those processes. Additionally, counties are required to perform risk-limiting audits. Since the 2020 elections, we have seen countless countlessly all across the country and here in this Commonwealth that there are serious security risks with allowing third parties access to election machines and software. The Secretary of the Commonwealth has been forced to decertify machines because of the security implications of having these third parties in our system. This practice costs the counties, and let me be frank, when I say counties, I mean the taxpayers of those counties millions of dollars. Given these facts, what is the practical purpose of a bill like this? To be honest, there is none. It simply serves to cast doubt in our elections. And the consequences of continuing to perpetuate falsehoods is irreparable harm to our institutions and our ability to govern. This weekend, we saw Brazilians storm their Congress in an attempt to overthrow an election that they believed was rigged because their last president refused to accept the results of a secure, free, and fair election. This happened only a few days after the two-year anniversary of January 6, 2021, when our own capital in Washington, D.C. was the site of an insurrection fueled by the same behavior. I'll rule you on board on that. Oh. Insurrection, nobody has been charged with that. There's not been a single charge against any of those people for uh, insurrection. So in this committee, we're not using that term. You're out of the word. Until somebody's charged with it, we don't use that here. And when the Capitol, our Capitol was stormed and attacked, it was fueled by the exact same behavior of the falsehoods. This all led to an inordinate number of election audits, which has resulted in absolutely two things. The absolute confirmation that our elections are already fair, free, and secure. The results were and are legitimate. And if they weren't, many of us would not be sitting in this, this seat right now because we wouldn't have been sworn into office because we didn't believe the election results were appropriate. The second thing it confirmed is that we wasted millions in taxpayer dollars to complete an exercise that was only ever meant to cast unreasonable doubt in our elections. Hardworking Pennsylvanians from all across the political spectrum work twice a year, every year, to conduct with the absolute highest integrity our elections. And this bill is a slap in the face, their face, and it is an insult to the work that they do. In fact, it is an insult to each and every one of us that resides in this commonwealth. Instead of spending taxpayer dollars addressing real issues like public education, fixing our infrastructure, or workforce development, we're dismantling our democracy. This is a solution in search, search of a problem that simply does not exist. It is a distraction, a false narrative to sow distrust in our systems and institutions. People are concerned with us simply because they either believe the falsehoods that led to incidents like January 6, 2021, and what we just saw in Brazil, or they have simply grown disillusioned and apathetic and no longer care to participate in the electoral process believing that we, the government, are a waste of time, energy, and money. And this constitutional amendment proves them right. I will be voting no and implore my colleagues to do the same as well. Is there any further discussion regarding the bill? Seeing none and hearing none, I'm going to assume there's a, uh, there are negative votes on this, so I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Our one, one Senate Bill 130.
vote of eight to three, the majority having voted in the affirmative, Senate Bill 130 is reported out of the State Government Committee, and the Senate State Government Committee now stands in recess until the call of the chair.